So a little bit about myself first. Um, I started uh, real estate investing in 1999, uh, part-time. I had a full-time job. Uh, six years later, uh, in 2005, I was able to quit my job and pursue real estate as a career one way or another. Um, the market was on fire in 05. Uh, we were uh, buying houses from the MLS, which is a scary proposition. Uh, I didn't know about distressed assets other than, hey, you know, some of the people that um, we were buying these houses from were having different types of difficulties. One guy was uh, living in a basement of, of the first two family house that we bought and uh, he needed the money. And so we bought the house and kicked him out of the basement and uh, proceeded to run that two family uh, now 25 years we've had that property. So in the very beginning, I didn't know much about real estate investing. Uh, I did get a mentor in 2007, and that was in the note space. And that's when my business took off. Uh, in 2005, like I said, I was able to quit my job, but I was flipping houses. The market had turned very sharply, as a lot of people know. Um, and we sold our last flip house in April of 2007, just under the wire. And for a year or so, I just kind of bounced around and uh, came across this, this new form of investing called note investing in 2007. Fantastic uh, opportunity for me. It just, it really just clicked. Uh, I was used to dealing with um, tenants and toilets and problems, and then now I'm dealing with non-performing mortgages. So the people that I'm dealing with now had a little bit more skin in the game because this is a mortgage. This is a mortgage that they had applied for and qualified for at some point previous to my purchase of it. And there was a little bit, there was a lot more skin in the game than dealing with a tenant who just can't pay you. Now I'm dealing with a homeowner who can't pay you. And it, it really uh, was a nice transition for us because um, we had tenants whose transmission blew up and we get it. And now we have borrowers whose transmissions blow up and, and we were able to feel those problems as well. So this non-performing note business uh, really took off for us. Uh, the only money that I had to apply to this business was my uh, 401k for my job. So I sat on that 401k for two years, uh, not knowing what to do with it until my men mentor said, go on the internet and read everything you can about self-directed IRAs. And you will come to find out that you can roll your dead 401k into a self-directed IRA and then at arm's length, use those funds to purchase my notes. So that's exactly what I did. I read everything I could find about self-directed IRAs. Uh, it was a fantastic program that the government provides all of us, but very few of us take advantage of it. Uh, I think three or four percent of the uh, adult Americans actually have and use a self-directed IRA. And of that three or four percent, a lot of people that actually do get into it really don't know what type of investments to purchase with their IRA. Uh, so I was very fortunate to pair those uh, things together and consider myself knowing more than most about what a self-directed IRA does. I, I do not by any means call myself an expert, but I know enough how to grow that IRA um, very rapidly uh, using non-performing real estate notes. So what the heck is a note and what, what, what have I been doing since I was seven? Uh, my mentor uh, had a connection with National City Bank. And with this connection at National City, um, National City was sitting on, this is even prior to the mortgage meltdown. Uh, he was buying paper from them in 2004, I think he started. And he 
was buying this non-performing mortgages from National City at a steep discount, uh, at a very steep discount. Now, these are non-performing second mortgages. There's not much of a market for these things. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the nuance of a non-performing second mortgage. The banks don't think that there's a market for this product. And so that's why we're able to get this stuff so cheap. The banks were taking our money, putting it onto the bottom line of their accounting and calling it a profit because they were able to write down the value of these non-performing loans to zero. If you look at a, uh, let's say you want to buy stock in Bank of America or Wells Fargo, when you review their prospectus to purchase that stock, you will find a clause in that prospectus with a provision to say that 4% or 5% of all of the mortgages that we underwrite and purchase or, or have uh, in our uh, portfolio will go non-performing. And that is part of the way the world goes around. 95% uh, of the people pay their mortgages and 5% of the people for some reason or another uh, are not able to pay. They Maybe they uh, should not have qualified for the loan or there's a sickness or there's a death in the family. Uh, there's a hardship, a loss of income uh, from one or both uh, people in the household. And that's paper we that we buy. Now, we're buying this paper at a steep discount. And it's the discount, it's the difference between what they owe and how much we pay for it. That's our profit. That's our margin. In that spread, we don't know where it's going to land, but in that spread somewhere is our uh, profit. And we're able to pass that on to the homeowner as well. Uh, some of that discount. So let's say their payment was $700 a month. Uh, we get in touch with them. Uh, we buy this loan for uh, cheap. We buy a $100,000 mortgage for, let's say, $30,000. So now they owe us the full $100,000, but we bought it for thirty, dollars and they were paying six hundred dollars a month. And now we pull out our trusty phone calculator gizmo thing here. We punch in some numbers and we say, you know what? We can afford three fifty dollars a month of you starting to make steady payments back into us. And we're okay with three fifty dollars a month. So we've lowered their monthly payment from $600 a month, which was too expensive for them to afford because that's why they went non-performing. We now lower it down to three fifty dollars a month. They love us. We're collecting three fifty dollars a month. It's going right back into my retirement account but there's a there's a thing that i didn't mention is while this loan went non-performing while it was at the old bank those monthly payments stacked up meaning they owed 600 600 600 so that's 7200 dollars a year that are these payments are stacking up and there's a late fee stacking up as well. So you might have $7,400 a year of these payments accumulating. Now, if this loan was not performing for five years by the time we bought it, you're looking at about $35,000, $38,000 worth of this arrears that is owed us. With the existing bank, before the bank that we bought this paper from, in in their laws, they can only accept the full amount, the $38,000, to reinstate that loan. And that's why they go non-performing and they stay non-performing. The bank cannot accept $15,000 to get this loan back on track. They need the full $38,000 because they have investors that are saying, hey, what are you doing only taking fifteen dollars They owe us thirty eight dollars or thirty six. dollars and so they have to follow certain guidelines because they're a publicly traded company and a bank, but we do not. So we buy that $100,000 mortgage, and this $38,000 worth of arrears comes with that loan as a gift. Here you go. This is free $38,000 that we use to negotiate our first settlement payment 
to say, listen, people, you owe us 38000 For every dollar that you give us, we'll give you $2 worth of equity in your house. In other words, you give us $10,000 right now, we can take $20,000 off of this $38,000. And there's variations, all different types of variations of how we can actually do this transaction to get them back on track so that they can start making that three fifty a month payment back to us. Usually into one of our retirement accounts. Uh, I was just on YouTube before I got on here tonight and there was these two guys um, <clears throat> talking about they had what's called a FI, a financial independence date. And the beginning of the year, everything, or, or the beginning of last year, everything was rock and rolling. Both of these guys were planning on retiring very soon. And, but they were, all their assets were tied up in the stock market. As most individuals that are planning retirement are in the stock market. And so these guys went on to say, well, that plan went sideways because my account is down 20% from where it was last year. And my date of 2023 for FI, for financial independence, is out the window. I don't even know how long it's going to take for me because I'm down 20%. That means I would actually have to get a 40% return just to get back to where I was. And I sat there thinking, man, how many people in this country are relying on the stock market to retire? Um, it's really not a really good way to stack up money. Um, and so these guys are buying into the, what they're calling a discount right now. But a stock is only sold at its current value. You can't pick up a share at 50 cents on the dollar. You just can't do it. They're, they're not going to sell you an $80 share of Microsoft for 40 bucks. You had to buy it way back when it was 40 bucks. So no shares come at a discount. This business is all about a discount. And that's what I love about it. In my mind, I am buying a secured asset, secured by real estate at a huge discount. And we are very good at and very good at teaching people how to get that money out of the investment and still make it a win for the homeowner. Now, sometimes, a lot of times, these homeowners are are in over their head with their first mortgage and maybe did some silly things. Some silly things are going on now uh, as well. People are taking out HELOCs again for debt consolidation, which is in most cases not a real good idea. Because the debt that they are paying off or paying down is short-term debt, but they're taking out a long-term loan. So, yeah, you know, you get a $50,000 check and you pay off your credit cards and maybe you pay off. Uh, I knew a guy who paid off his motorcycle. He had a, he had a fixed uh, loan on his motorcycle uh, with great terms. And then he took out a HELOC on his house. And now he's going to pay off that motorcycle for 30 years. Well, it gets really old after a while of paying and paying and paying and paying and paying. And I've hold, held, had borrowers tell me, listen, that, that HELOC that you bought did me no good. And you bought yourself a bad loan. What that fellow did not understand is that I have the right to foreclose on his residence to force him to figure out and work with me on some type of repayment plan. He does not yet realize that I am offering a discount. I am offering him uh, some counseling as to what, um, how he should be spending his money. Uh, I, I've had several conversations with borrowers where I say, listen, when I give you a dollar for $2 worth of equity, that's a 100% return on your investment. I'm giving you the opportunity. At a dollar, you're getting a 0% return. But I'm giving you $2 worth of value for $1. You can't get that in the stock market. 
If you get that type of return in the stock market, that's ridiculous. I can even give people a 50% return. Say for every dollar you give me, I'll give you a dollar fifty in equity in your house. 50% return. So I'm actually training my borrowers to be come and start thinking like an investor would think. 50% returns, 30% returns. They don't, nobody, a lot of people just don't think in percentages and returns. But here I am teaching these folks how to become investors in their own house. And they appreciate it. And they are very willing to go and talk to Uncle Ed, who can lend them the $20,000 to get this $40,000 worth of equity in their house. I have talked to Uncle Ed and gave them the opportunity to buy the loan from me. And I say, hey, however you want to handle it with your niece and nephew, I'll sell you this loan today for X. You do whatever you want. <laughs> well, no, I'm just going to give them a loan to pay this off. I said, I already have the loan. It's already existing. It's attached to the property. Why create a new loan? Just buy this loan from me. And you want to burn it? Burn it. You want to collect on it? Collect on it. When they sell, you want to sit on it for 20 years? Do that. When they sell their house, you don't have to go for the full 40 or 50 or 60. You can take 10 and do your niece and nephew a favor. There's all different types of things that you can do with, with, these, with this business. This is what I teach. I'm good at teaching it. I've got a lot of successful students that have gone on to blow me away as far as the deal size that you're doing. Uh, I've got uh, other students that I've been able to partner with and share the wealth of notes that I've purchased, of notes that we've purchased together. Um, it's, been a, it's been a fantastic run. I, I started teaching this business in 2010 or 2011. And I started this with a good friend of mine. We were partners teaching. Then he got very busy with his business. He owns a servicing company now, may even be on this call. And he runs a very successful servicing company. That's how well we learned the business. We talked almost on a daily basis about our loans, about what the best techniques are to teach people this business, about what he's learned, he has seen so many more loans than I have seen over the years. I've seen thousands, maybe in the tens of thousands now. And uh, the experience level as as we get older, <laughs> um, I'm able to pass that information on. I, I don't know. Uh, the, the cost of our education program is is cheap compared to the amount of money um, that you can make by learning a whole new career. Uh, this is a whole new career that you can eventually stop doing what you're doing for money when you realize that, hey, you can have a $100,000 day in this business. Uh, we just had a $100,000 day. A borrower sold their house. We get a call from the title company. And... We, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be taking questions um, in the in the second half of this. I see that someone um, is raising their hand. Uh, if you could, actually, if you don't think you're going to be able to stick around to the end, type your question into the chat or into the Q&A, and I will answer it, and this recording will be available uh, to everyone um, that's on this call. I appreciate that. And so... <clears throat> We were, I've been able to take all of the experience of all of my deals that I've done, all of the deals that my students have done, uh, all the deals that my friends have done, and all the <laughs> crazy stories that come out of this business. Uh, you know, every industry has its crazy stories. Um, and so... The, those crazy stories are what actually um, allows you to prepare for some weird stuff down the road. And um, we're still seeing crazy stuff. I've been been at it 15 years now, and it's uh, still crazy. 
So yes, you can learn a new career for under 10 grand is that is just uh, a ridiculous amount of information um, that can be transferred and the ability to network as well. So what I've done, what we've done, uh, both uh, my wife and my two kids, Julie and Jimmy, have built out this business in our, all of our own specialties. And one of the specialties, one of the big projects that we took on during the beginning of COVID was building out a networking platform that I'm going to show you here in, in a few minutes. It's where all of the training material resides, all of the recorded training material resides. And uh, I want to give you a tour of that. I want to give you an invitation to join that website for free. So yeah, that's the that's the note business in a nutshell. Um, we are starting to see an increase. Now the note business has always been around. There are ebbs and tides as far as the amount of product that becomes and comes available. Uh, during COVID, uh, all the banks were focused on other areas of their business and note selling was not even close to the top of their priority. Uh, you will find once you get into this business that banks that are totally solvent have the time to liquidate some of their non-performing assets. Some banks are actually forced to liquidate their assets. Uh, I believe that we're coming into lean times for the banks. Um, banks are going to start looking at how can we maximize our profits. Uh, let's get rid of our non-performing paper we can capitalize on that transfer, uh, getting the sale done, and we also can um, use our cash reserves that we've had to hold on to for our non-performing product. We'll have that to be liquid as well. Uh, there's all kinds of rules that the FDIC requires for banks that are holding a lot of non-performing paper, and that's why they sell it to people like us. And we're starting to see an increase already. Um, just in the last two weeks, uh, we've received three tapes uh, from two different sources. Now, what's called a tape is a list of these non-performing assets that the bank has chosen to liquidate. Uh, I often get people to say, hey, listen, I got a vacant house that's around the corner from my house. I know that the homeowners moved out. I bet you, can we go after that note? And yeah, you can try. You know, it is public record. Usually who owns that note? You can go to the county records and see, look up the address and say, yeah. Uh, 123 Main Street has a, uh, a first mortgage of $200,000 from Bank of America and a second mortgage uh, HELOC from Wells Fargo for thirty eight. You can sometimes go ahead and try to contact, good luck, but contact Bank of America, say, hey, listen, I'm looking at a house on 123 Main Street. Um, they're not going to, they're not going to bother. So we primarily go after loans that the banks have decided to liquidate and they know that they're going to liquidate these loans and we have to go where those houses are. We have to go where those borrowers are. Now, why do I buy second mortgages? That's crazy. Um, because we can actually get foreclosed on by the first mortgage and, and get wiped out. And yes, in the very beginning, I scratched my head going, why is this guy teaching us what appears from the outside to be a very dangerous uh, position? As we got into it more, we quickly realized that the amount of due diligence that we can perform on that non-performing second mortgage to realize that, hey, we've still got a homeowner who lives in the house. We know that because the lights are on, the water turned on, the gas is turned on, the electric's turned on. All of those, uh, we call a gas company and find out if the, you know, or if the heat is still on in that house. We have a homeowner who made a decision at some point in their life 
uh, spouse lost her job. There was an illness, sickness, all the reasons, I, uh, possible reasons I gave you before. They sat down with their list of people that they owe money to, and they go through the checklist. And let's start with the car loan. Well, we need a car because you need to go out and find a new job. So that car payment of 430 bucks, we have to continue paying that. They will come and tow our car away within three months. Let's keep paying the car loan. Obviously, our food, we need to continue eating. Uh, school loans, well, you know, maybe we can skip on a couple of uh, college loans uh, that you took out you know, 15 years ago. We can look at that. <clears throat> What about this second mortgage that we took out to pay off our um, our in ground pool? Well, they can't they can't foreclose and take our house for not paying that, right? Yeah, right. So let's stop paying that second mortgage. That's six hundred bucks a month that we can we can use towards um, other things that we need, and uh, we have to continue paying our first mortgage because that I know that if we stop paying that, they will foreclose and take our house so let's try not paying this second mortgage on wells fargo so after three months they receive a couple of letters maybe some certified mail maybe a, a fedex or two from wells fargo uh stating that you are seriously delinquent they throw them in the garbage nothing really happens maybe they get a few phone calls because when they filled out the application they put down their phone numbers because everything was peachy keen when they filled out the app. And now they're getting phone calls and all they have to do is say, please do not call us anymore. Click. And the bank is not allowed now to collect on that. Some borrowers will go to an attorney and the attorney says, listen, you can go into a chapter seven bankruptcy and that will actually take that loan off of your personal um indebtedness and that'll be that so they file for chapter seven it's the cheapest bankruptcy there is they wipe out not only their personal guarantee on that second mortgage but they also get rid of thirty five thousand dollars worth of credit card debt or fifty thousand or a hundred thousand whatever they racked up and in six months they're done with the bankruptcy and we can no longer personally pursue them on that debt. I would say in my portfolio, 90% of the loans that I own are at chapter seven bankruptcy. And so the only thing that I am uh, legally allowed to do is start foreclosure on that second mortgage. And I'm foreclosing on the house. They just happen to be living in a house in most cases, unless it's a rental, which I don't buy rentals uh, very often, rental mortgages. Um, but we now foreclose on that house. And the borrowers are like, hey, you're foreclosing. I'm like, yeah, you, you're not. You, we need to come to an agreement or we will continue to foreclose. And at some point, this property will go to auction, go to sale, and either we will end up with this house or someone will bid us over and we will get paid from that bid and that person will end up with this house. But one way or another, you're going to have to move out and lose out on all the money that you've been paying into this mortgage for all these years. Well, that's horrible. I'm like, yeah, well. It's, it is horrible. That's not what my bankruptcy attorney told me. I said, well, let's get him or her on the phone right now. And we've done this several times. Uh, we get the uh, bankruptcy attorney on the phone and they say, you told me I didn't have to pay my mortgage. And the attorney says, no, I told you that you are not personally responsible for that debt anymore. I never told you that you needed to stop paying the mortgage. I did tell you that you could lose your house if the second mortgage forecloses. Some of them say that. Some of them didn't say that to the to the borrower when they took out this Chapter 7 uh, voluntary petition document. 
And so now they realize that they are in a position that they do need to talk to us. And it usually comes down to them going to Uncle Eddie and borrowing the money and giving us that lump down payment. That lump down payment is always at least the amount that I paid for the loan. And then the monthly payments that stream in for the next 20 years is infinite money that goes right into my retirement account. And I try to work it so that that downstroke at the beginning of the payment stream covers at least 80 to 90% of the purchase price. Uh, that's a beautiful thing. And I get all that money back while this new monthly 350 a month stream starts coming in. I take that lump and I go out and buy another note or two. And uh, that's been our model for the last 15 years now. We uh, have enjoyed that model. We purchase loans. We decide whether are we going to foreclose right away or are we going to sit on this thing? Sometimes we buy loans where there's absolutely no equity protecting our position. But we stress to the banks that we're buying these things from that you're not going to get a very good offer from us because your loan is completely underwater. And they go, we understand that. We totally understand that. And we agree that this loan is underwater. And it's uh, something that we just sit on for a while. Well, we've had such a run-up in home values uh, in the last two years that all of our underwater loans, and I mean all of our underwater loans, are now covered in equity. Uh, at least 50 or 60% of our indebtedness is covered in equity. So there's there's no real business that I've come across where you get this double win effect. We bought a loan in 2018. Uh, the homeowner, we bought it and just sat on it. We sent out our, our uh, required notices to the homeowner. They took them and threw them in the garbage, didn't even look at them. And then we said, fine. So they continue to pay down their first mortgage. Every month they're paying down principal on their first mortgage, which is increasing the equity protecting our position. And that's with no outside appreciation at all. They continue to pay down the principal on that first mortgage. It's getting lower and smaller and lower and smaller. Our loan is continuing to accrue interest, which is going up. My net worth goes up every month because of that piece of paper just keeps appreciating in, in uh, interest. And that interest just keeps accruing and that's going up. And these balances of these first mortgages are going down. And to the point where one day it's like, you know what? Let's not be lazy anymore. Let's go ahead and close it. Call a foreclosure attorney. Give them all the documentation that they need, all the paperwork, all the figures. They start foreclosure and they get the borrower to wake up and start talking to us. Um, that's been our model for the last 15 years. Uh, they wake up. They borrow the money. They come up with it. Sometimes they sell their house. They, sometimes they tell us we have been underwater with this house ever since we bought it in 2009. It's been nothing but a nightmare. We're going to go ahead and sell it. Sometimes they ask us for a short payoff. Sometimes we offer to give them a short payoff. And sometimes they just pay us off in full. Uh, the last one that we got was a loan in California. We got a check for $98,000. They sold their house. That house, that note, when we bought that note, was completely underwater. The house was worth six, and they owed eight on the first. Uh, then they owed us 100 on the second, which was completely underwater. I bought that note very cheaply, uh, sat on it. It was a beautiful house. And uh, one day, the title company called... A, we started foreclosure. They put the house on the market. We left them alone. They got the house sold. And uh, we got a check and uh, paid in full. So 
I don't know of any other business where our laziness is so well rewarded. And uh, it's a it's a fantastic, uh, interesting play. Okay, so everybody write this down. Uh, the name of our new website is trulypassive.com. T-R-U-L-Y-P-A-S-S-I-V-E.com. Now, this was a COVID project. Uh, we started this in July of 2020. And uh, it started as kind of a, uh, you know, I've been wanting to do this for a while. Uh, get some type of a real estate oriented website where people can connect where people can find deals, where people can find money for real estate related assets and a place where people can actually uh, get together with other people and trade ideas, share ideas, partner up. Uh, all of my um, alumni students are on this website uh, as a member. Uh, this website has, uh, uh, it, so it basically is a mimic of Facebook without all the politics. Um, it's a news feed, meaning, hey, you know, here's a picture of Sally's cat and dog and um, somebody made lasagna last night for dinner. This is how it looks. And um you have that type of news feed. And then what's more important is you have uh, this icon right here, which is groups. Uh, so right now there's 13 groups in here. When you join my website, if you want to start a group, hey, I want to start a group on uh, buying mobile homes in Alabama. Great. Let me know. I'll give you access to create that group. You can go through and invite the members. Here's all the members right here. You can go through and one by one or 10 by 10, invite every member into your group. And then you start creating content inside that group. So this is a brand new group here. Uh, business bank suggestions and or reviews. So this was just created like six days ago uh, by one of my students, and as he becomes more, more aggressive in him contacting banks looking for more assets to purchase, he will be populating information into that website. And so that's just one example of a group. Like I created a reader's book club. Um, I haven't put anything in here a while, in a while. Been a little busy doing other things. When, I don't know about you guys, but when I read a really good book, I want to tell everybody about it. Like I read a book. I just got so much out of this that I think I, I jumped started my, my education two years by reading one book. Uh, that's how powerful a group is like that. Uh, solid IRA. So I have told you that I'm really big into self-directing, um, my own retirement accounts and helping my students and my children build their IRAs as well. And so that's another group that we plan on building. Like I said, this literally is a brand new website. Uh, I have a 401k study group. Uh, so I'm, I'm involved in my own self-directed solo 401k retirement plan. I am, I am um, self-employed. And so I'm taking advantage of the 401k laws that all employers are allowed to take advantage of. And because I'm self-employed, I'm an employer. And I can pack, excuse me, I can pack up to 65,000 approximately dollars a year in untaxed money into my 401k. So if I made 400 grand last year, I can take 65,000 of that and put it into this and only pay taxes on 335 because I put that money into my retirement account. That's crazy awesome. 
Uh, it's better than a self-directed IRA. Um, I talk about that in this group. When someone comes up with more information, hey, you know, this year it's actually going to be changed to $69,000. Put that information in there. I quote uh, irs.gov website quotes in this group um, saying that, hey, the laws have changed. It's actually gotten better or it's gotten worse. That's in this group. I have online, uh, I have events that are listed um, as I as we get better at running this website, an event like this evening will be listed on this events page. Um, and then and I have my online learning. So I have created, let me, uh, let me go to uh, my courses that we have available so far. Now, the whole plan of this was to get several educators onto this platform and have them provide upon our approval content, education content and courses that they can sell related to real estate, whether even if it's some type of self-help type of uh, stuff. I'm really big into uh, reading that type of material and studying that type of material. Uh, I believe that everyone has room for improvement. Uh, we have we have received a lot of programming over the years from from parents and teachers and clergy and um, just people in general. Some of the programming has been very good and some of it not so accurate. Uh, so I have been busy reprogramming my my brain for the last uh, ten years or so, and. Um, so the idea was to have a lot of a lot of uh, different trainers on here. Um, so that's that's where I am. Uh, so so let me go through and Julie, feel free to jump in if I'm totally screwing this thing up or not. So my main course is called Fast Track Business. Fast Track Business came to me um, right when I started building this website. Uh, I I was teaching this business in a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. It was like twelve thousand bucks, and every week I would get with the student, and I would work directly on their business. I would help them open up accounts, LLCs, start show them one-on-one -on -one how to go out and contact banks, how to work the assets that they were purchasing. Uh, any aspect that they needed, I was there for them. And then I thought back, and I had done that for, man, probably eight eight years of my life, uh, doing one-on-one -on -one mentorships with follow-up webinars and, and training material that I provided in recorded fashion. And I realized that I could only handle so many students because of my day, my my day is only so long, and I found myself repeating myself day after day after day, talking about the same things over and over. And I'm like, this is not how I learned this business. I learned this business from my mentor, who literally did a call every other week, uh, maybe a two-hour call every other week, and that's how I got to meet all of the people that started buying notes from me when I decided to go out and broker notes. Uh, once our mentorship blew up, uh, he went on to bigger and better things. And now I had 10 or 15 of the people that were on our mentorship group call going, now what? We need notes. We were buying everything from our mentor, and he was the big problem in the project. And so I took it upon myself to go out on LinkedIn and various other things and develop how I was going to get product to sell to my friends who had no product. Everyone else was... was uh, wondering how we were going to continue in the note business with no notes. 
And uh, I had I had one um, big company friend of mine who said, we're a note company with no notes. And I took it upon myself to say, you know what? I'm going to put this on me. And I went out and I found a company out in Long Beach, California, who was buying and working their non-performing second mortgages. And I contacted them. Uh, I remember I was sitting in the Starbucks. A guy that I met on LinkedIn met me at the Starbucks and Barnes and Noble. And he said, and I told him, I said, listen, if, I'll give you a percentage of whatever I buy from whoever you put me in touch with. He slid the phone across and he said, here, the guy's name is George or whatever. So I talked to him. I sat there, probably talked to him for an hour, telling him all about how we were buying non-performing seconds and working them. He says, I never thought I'd ever meet anyone else outside of our organization that is doing the same business that we're doing. I said, well, if you're buying loans for a nickel, I'll buy them from you for a dime. If you're buying them for a dime, I'll buy them from you at 20 cents. He says, well, we're not buying them at a nickel, but we are buying them at a dime and we will sell you all the notes that you can handle at 20 cents. I said, you're on. So I met that guy three months later at Starbucks and I, I rounded up 3,500 bucks from all my friends that we had bought that first note purchase. And it, it was a scene out of a gangster movie. I had that envelope of cash and I slid it across the table. The guy opened it up. He was like, like, oh my God, this is awesome. And that was the beginning of my brokering uh, non-performing real estate residential second mortgages. So I was selling now to five or six people in my group and I worked out all the kinks and that was the beginning of me sourcing notes. Now, had I not been in a group setting, if I was in a one-on-one -on -one situation mentorship with my mentor, I would not have built that note relationship with all those other people. And it was because of the group setting that introduced me to all of these really cool note investors. Uh, and the thing about note investors, I'm going to go a little off track here for a second. The thing about note investors are 90% of the ones that I meet are already successful in some other form of business. Uh, it's very rare that you get somebody who's um, just in off the street saying this, this is where I want to be. Uh, it's not like wholesaling houses where one minute they're, um, you know, have, have no income and all of a sudden they get into the note business. For some reason, this business attracts people that have already made money in something else. And all of the people that were in my group mentorship program that I was a part of were successful at something else before they discovered this note business. And so I had all these people now that had money, that had access to money, and I had access to them because of that group setting. And I took it upon myself to go out and introduce myself to all of these people. I realized the importance of that. Because these are people in a space that I wanted to play in. And what if I'm the hero and I go out and find these notes and sell them to my friends? Um, that's exactly what I did. And I learned now how to build that network by introducing myself to more and more note investors, build out my brokering to now I a minimum I make is $2,000 a file. When I find a note, I sell it to one of you guys. Uh, I buy it for 20,000, I sell it to you for 22,000. We usually don't buy one note at a time. So this could be 50 notes. Right now, one of my students uh, brought us a tape. I think there's 37 assets. So he has the opportunity to bring those notes 
to my group, to my fast track business educational group and have the opportunity to make $70,000 if we end up buying these notes through him, through the bank that he found these notes from. Uh, it's a group setting and it is a fantastic way to meet other note investors and team up with them through me. Now, my mentor, he didn't want us all knowing each other. That was my idea. I used to get on that call. Just like tonight, I opened up this webinar at 20 to 7 Eastern so that anybody who comes in says, okay, it looks like the webinar is going to be on tonight. And I was hoping that, hey, maybe, you know, when I was getting on that call, our call started at 7.30 on Tuesday nights. I would get on at 7, and I would just, it was a free conference call or something like that. And um, I would just leave my line open, and hopefully somebody would chime in 10 minutes early. And I'd say, hey, who is this? And they'd say, hey, oh, it's John. Hey, John, yeah. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, this is Mike. I'm, uh, you know, and I would introduce myself. Because I got to hear him talk on the mentor call. And now I can discuss with him how my deals are going. And, and I got a chance to network with this guy. And I'm writing his name down. I got his email address. And now this guy is part of my new network. It was that easy. And I was able to pick all these people out of this call that I wanted to do business with. And I built my network just by being that person. So what I'm doing now with Fast Track Business is we meet every other Thursday night. And I want everyone to meet each other. It, this is not a group solely about me. This is a group solely about getting other people to meet on purpose. Um, everybody, you know, everybody, the way we did it. In, in the original mentor call, it was by accident. It was about me making the effort to go and introduce myself to all of these strangers. But now I can do that on purpose on these fast track mentor calls. I hold the calls every other Thursday night. Everybody gets a chance to talk to each other. In the training, I can open this up here. Um, and this is this is actually what it looks like. So I've got 19 people enrolled right now. And these are the courses that you can go through. Um, so basically, welcome to Fast Track Business by Note Conference. That's me. Um, and all of these modules that you have is, uh, so this is basically what I just talked about getting better friends. I mean, I'm not saying that your friends that you have right now are no good. I'm just saying that you can keep those friends, but you got to get new ones. Uh, people that are striving to do what you're trying to do, which is get wealthy and build your retirement uh, through the note business. Um, what better way to make friends than to get to know people, these 19 people that are already enrolled, uh, and, and get to know how they plan on building out their non-performing note business uh, and getting better habits and holding the mindset of a successful investor. All of these modules, um, networking and um, all, the, all the different types of tools that I've painstakingly put these modules together. And I'm adding to them as people uh, say, hey, listen, we need a module on um, bankruptcy. Okay, let me let me do an advanced bankruptcy uh, module because they're scared to death of bankruptcy. I was scared to death of bankruptcy uh, in the very beginning. And so there you have that. Um, let me expand these. And then, um, so Jewel, I know that we have... So again, like I said, I started um, building this out in October of 2019. And we started our Thursday night calls. And I started recording every call. 
Got so it, the, got the calls that we have that are every other week, um, it's a separate course called Mentor Calls. Got it, so there's got two it. separate um, sections. So there's the Fast Track Business Training, and then there's the Mentor Calls, got which it. is exactly right there. My expert children here. Sweet. So you could, oh, September 26th, that was the first call. So uh, we've been at this a long time. And we've moved through quite a few students over the time. And um, so you can see that I have different guests up here. I have um, this guy's very, everybody I have is very successful. I mean, it's just the, the kind of people that um, I attract. You've got five pages of this many calls. So I don't even know how many. One, two, it looks like there's about 20 or 25, and I've got five pages worth of um, calls. I have not duplicated the content yet. Contacting banks, calling banks, it's they're not the same. Uh, tools of the trade, uh, trust, custodians, IRAs. I mean, everybody should be talking about having an IRA, owning a trust, Owning a trust inside your IRA. Uh, I go into extensive material on these calls. And then if you still have questions, I will get an expert in here. Um, Money Lender Pro. Uh, this is Josh Whitman. This is our, our note accounting software that we use. Um, this interview with James DeBarry, he is investing. Uh, he's one of my... Uh, uh, alumni students who uh, him and I own notes together, very successful note investor, uh, really understands this business thoroughly. And uh, we've become very good friends over the years. And uh, so I had him come in and tell us all about his whole note investing career that he's gone on to create um, interviews, different things. All this material is available to you. Uh, once you get into no conference fast track, the whole idea is to get as much of this knowledge as quickly as possible. Uh, how long it'll take you to go through um, this material. These calls last about, I would say they average maybe an hour, hour and a half per call. You know, you can, you can speed them up a little bit if you, if, if you're uh if you, you want to get through certain areas that may not be relative to you. But the thing with the relevance is it may not be relative relevant to you now as you're going through it because you don't have a deal that dealt with that until you go, oh, wait a minute, that was on call. Um, uh, you know, now I'm, ca I'm calling banks. And the November 19th call, let me go back and review that because now I'm calling banks and I'm finding assets and let me go back. And so you can just keep bouncing back and forth and going through these recordings, these archives. Uh, this goes all the way up to, uh, to present time. Um, this is all through COVID and um, real case studies. It's just, I don't know anywhere else. Uh, here's an interview with my buddy, Kevin. Uh, he's the one that we originally uh, created a note education program together. Kevin owns Madison Management Services, a uh, very successful note investor slash business owner slash Mr. Tech. I don't know anybody who loves the tech end of this business more uh, with when it comes to accounting and uh, servicing with his borrowers and with his um, not only with his borrowers, but with his clients and with his employers, employees to get them to understand the, the tech part of the mechanics of all of the accounting, what goes into this business, lean position and title. Uh, I run this note business from anywhere. Uh, I've closed brokering deals on a, a villa porch in Puerto Rico um, where, where not only did we pay for the trip, but we, we made a nice chunk of change just sitting there brokering deals, uh, drinking cocktails in Puerto Rico. So we can do this business from anywhere. Uh, I talk about that. 
Um, right now we're coming up. This is end of year, January 21 of uh, 2021. I've got up on my whiteboard right now that I need to create my 1098s for my borrowers for this year. Um, that's anybody who's paid more than $600 of interest to you. You need to send them a 1098. Uh, it has to go out. Uh, obviously, this is right at the end of January. They have to go out before January 31st of for the preceding year. And uh, so that's why this is a very relative uh, uh, call at this period of time because um, these have to be done by the end of January every year. And if I could just jump in real quick, guys, um, this is a it's a group call. People can unmute themselves at any time. They can email Mike ahead of time with a question, and then he can prepare a response to that. This is there's a really big benefit into being on those calls live as well as accessing the recording afterwards. I know 96 lessons seems like a lot. Um, I do recommend starting at the most recent and kind of working your way back, kind of picking and choosing. Um, but make sure, make sure you be on those live calls. That's where you can respond to other people's deals, present your own information, a, a book, an article, whatever it is. Um, the live calls are unedited, um, for the most part unscripted. <laughs> and <laughs> this is just the, <laughs> um, it's a chance to kind of just be with other people who are just really passionate about notes. Yeah, like like last week. Thanks for that, Jewel. Uh, last week, um, I forget exactly. Someone was having an issue, and um, three or four of the other members chimed in with some really good suggestions uh, that were business related, but not note related. But but note related because notes are you know running a business, and. Um, so that was a that was a real camaraderie type of call that we had last week, um, where everyone gave one of the students uh, a real uh, leg up as far as how to tackle a uh, total business question. But this is called fast track business. This is designed for you to be up and running in a business now. Getting back to, I'm I just turned 64 years old, and the thought of had I not discovered this note business, I probably would be relying on my rental income, and probably would have been more heavily involved in rental income. Uh, I own rentals now. And I just went and looked at a property today that is a commercial property with 11 office spaces. And I think I'm actually going to put an offer in on that property um, because I am in the process of getting property management team involved. Uh, I plan on doing a lot of traveling uh, for the rest of my life. And, um, but I probably had I not, held these non-performing mortgages in my retirement accounts, um, it would have been a different story. And uh, it's it's just such a beautiful thing to own a mortgage inside your retirement account. So you, the way, the, real quickly, the way it works, and I totally covered this in so many different calls, but the way a Roth IRA works is if you were to do a rollover into a Roth IRA, let's say, so in my case, I had $100,000 in my 401k for my job. I quit that job in July of 2005. That money sat in, I don't even know what the company that was, um, in a 401k. I kept it in cash. I kept it in the money market. And everybody, everybody, all my buddies at work did not do well with that 401k. I, I managed to accumulate a hundred grand. And now you can take that hundred grand and roll that over a portion of that into a traditional and then another portion of that into what's called a Roth IRA. 
Now, when I rolled the 401k into my traditional, that was not a taxable event. It was a straight apples for apples. 80 grand went from my 401k into my traditional, but the remaining 20,000, I rolled that into a Roth or I could have rolled that into a Roth. I didn't at the time. That's beside the point. I could have rolled that into a Roth and made that a taxable event meaning I would have been rolled that over as ordinary income. And so my 20,000 would have looked like maybe 16,000 by the time I converted it into a Roth. But that 16,000 that is now sitting in that Roth, let's say I buy one note with that 16 grand, or I partner up with one of you and I buy a note for 30,000 bucks. So now, 50% of that ownership sits in your account, whether it's inside your IRA or outside your IRA and just your regular bank account. You own 50%, I own 50%. As that mortgage starts to pay, that money has to go back into that Roth. 50% of whatever that borrower pays us, 50% of that goes back into my Roth. It comes into the Roth tax-free. So let's say that borrower gives us $30,000 downstroke. 15 of that goes into my Roth. And then out of this $350 a month, uh, I get 175 bucks coming into my Roth for the next 20 years. All of the money that comes in to my Roth grows tax free not tax deferred tax free meaning when i turn 72 and i have to start taking out my minimum distributions i'm not taxed on that i am not ever taxed on that money again the seed money yes that was taxed the 20 grand that i took at that taxable event that seed money goes in as a tax tax taxable event. Any money that I grow on top of that seed money comes into the account with no tax liabilities. Uh, it's just the opposite for a traditional. Traditional, the 80,000 I rolled into my traditional, that 80,000, there was no taxable event. Let's say I grow that $80,000 to $300,000. Now, when I take that money out, any time after you're 59 and a half, I can take that money out and now it's taxed as ordinary income. Now, it's taxed at ordinary income as a, as a taxable event with my regular 1040 account, a 1040 um, tax form as ordinary income and that's fine. So if I grew it from 80,000 to 300,000 or, or a million bucks or 2 million bucks, I do pay taxes for that year on the distribution that I took. So that's deferred taxes that I will be paying down the line. So this is the kind of stuff that I cover. And this is the kind of stuff that I want my students talking about. I don't want them talking about football games or, or basketball. I want them talking about when we're talking about business, we're talking about these kind of things. Uh, there's a time. What you focus on expands. And uh, I'm, I'm actually doing a podcast right now uh, with a fellow who really has no assets, no accounts or anything. I said, listen, just take 500 bucks, open up a self-directed IRA. And now at least you can go on the website, you can go online, you can log in and you can look at your 500 bucks. Okay, big deal, 500 bucks. Well, you have to continually look at that to say, what the heck can I do with that 500 bucks? Who can I lend that money to and get it back as a return? You may find a realtor who's got a closing uh, that's coming up in two months, but they, they could use 500 bucks right now. 
You lend them 500 bucks and they pay you back 650 when the closing happens. Grow it. Pay attention to it. Look at it. Think about it. Listen to other people in their conversations. Come into Note Conference Fast Track and, and offer up, you know, a loan. People constantly need money. And get that money to start working for you. And uh, if it's a Roth, even better. Because now you lend out 500 you get 650 back. That 150 that's free money. That's taxable. That's untaxed. It'll never be taxed as, as your income. Unless they change the rules. But if they change the rules, there's going to be a riot. So I don't think that's going to happen. But... Um, so that's the program. That's why I converted this to a group setting. I want everyone to network and do business with each other. Uh, it's working out well. 